Welcome back, everyone. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 through 23 state, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin, Parthenos, shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin, Alma, shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew is using a Greek word that clearly means virgin to translate the Hebrew Alma. But there seems to be a problem. A Hebrew Alma it just simply means a, a young woman. And if the Hebrew writer wanted to insist that it is a virgin he's referring to, he would have said Betula. Christians are very well aware of the staggering problem that when we look at Isaiah 7.14, we look at the original, we discover that the single most important point is that, as far as the church is concerned, is that this woman is a virgin when she conceives. But when we look at Isaiah 7.14, uh, we don't find that one word. There is no other word like it. There is only one way in both biblical and modern Hebrew to convey certain virginity, and that is betula. There is no other way to convey that. And as it turns out, uh, that word appears nowhere in Isaiah 7.14. In fact, that word appears nowhere in the entire seventh chapter of Isaiah. Islamreligion.com says the Hebrew word alma used in Isaiah 7.14 means young woman or maiden, not a virgin. The Hebrew word for virgin is betulah. Islamawareness.com, there is no mention of a virgin in the original prophecy, the Hebrew word for which is betulah. Answeringchristianity.com says nowhere is the young woman called a virgin in Isaiah 7.14. I see such comments frequently on my channel as well. Isaiah doesn't say virgin in the original Hebrew, but Matthew thought it did, because whoever wrote Matthew clearly didn't know or read the Hebrew in Isaiah. Sad. Just sad. The word for virginity in Hebrew is betulah. Isaiah didn't use that word for a very good reason. In effect, the claim is that the Septuagint translator didn't know Hebrew very well, and neither did Matthew. But Matthew did know Greek. Therefore, Matthew had no choice but to read the Greek Septuagint, which misled him into thinking that Isaiah 7.14 was a prophecy about Jesus' virgin birth. First, let's address the claim that only the Hebrew word betulah can refer to a virgin and not alma, the Hebrew word that's used in Isaiah 7.14. Notice that in Genesis 24, Rebekah is referred to both as betulah and alma. It is therefore impossible to assert that alma cannot refer to a virgin. That's how easy it is to show such a claim is false. However, we can go much further than this. Christoph Rico published a semantic study of the Hebrew word Alma. His monograph was originally published in French and later translated into English with the help of several people, including Dr. Peter Gentry. Professor Rico's conclusions are very, very strong. From an inductive point of view, namely from the point of view of the attested evidence, the examination of all the uses, both those found in the versions and available texts, lead the researcher to endorse the following conclusion. Alma designates a teenage girl who is a virgin. Let's look at one passage of scripture cited by Professor Rico from the Song of Songs. Sixty queens there may be, and eighty concubines, and virgins, Alma, the word that's not supposed to mean virgin, beyond number. In the ancient Near East, kings frequently had three categories of women. The first category was virgin. Once the king slept with these women, they became part of the second category, the concubines. And finally, if the king really liked you, maybe you would make it to the status of queen. Notice that you can clearly see these distinctions in the first three lines of the verse that we just read. And once again, we have the lemma, alma, which in context has to mean virgin. It's critical to notice that alma parallels the same context in the book of Esther, where na'ara betula is used instead. Na'ara is a generic term for a young woman, but if you want to specify a virgin, you add betula. Alma, on the other hand, needs no such qualification. It's a much more precise term, clearly referring to a virgin, that stands on its own. Moving now to Isaiah 7.14, Christophe Rico's analysis is lengthy and detailed, 
but I just want to share with you a couple of his observations. If the word Alma had designated only an ordinary adolescent, not necessarily virgin, then we would be confronted with an obscure verse. For the whole structure of the text has previously highlighted with important rhetorical devices the singularity of the oracle that was proclaimed. In fact, the presence of Alma at the heart of Isaiah 7.14 would seem almost inessential, for the conception of a child calls in principle for a young mother. On the other hand, if one held a meaning of the term that was more precise than that of young woman and interpreted the word as designating a celibate nubile woman who is not necessarily a virgin, the word alma would be considered somehow awkward in an oracle called to reassure and sustain the house of David, for it could cast doubt on the legitimacy of his birth. In ancient Israel, a king would only marry a celibate girl upon the condition that she was a virgin. If the word Alma designates, however, a young virgin girl, the birth of the child immediately acquires the status of a sign. The semantic data from the other uses of Alma help inform our understanding of the oracle in Isaiah 7.14. Again, Rico concludes in biblical text, when the word Alma was used, it always conveyed the general meaning of adolescent girl who had never known a man. That sounds remarkably like Mary in Matthew's gospel. It seems like Matthew got it right after all. There are many who have misused the Hebrew Bible for their own purposes. Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. I'm quoting in Hebrew. But Matthew isn't one of them. Before we finish, I want to look briefly at the function of the oracle in Isaiah 7.14. The Lord begins by addressing Ahaz in Isaiah 7.10. Then the conversation shifts to Isaiah, addressing the entire Davidic line, the house of David. When Isaiah redirects the conversation, he shifts to my God, distancing Ahaz from the conversation, and also switches to a series of plurals, as I've indicated in bold. Notice, for example, that the Lord himself will give you, plural, a sign. The sign is not directly to Ahaz. Ahaz is finished. His decisions set in motion the destruction of Israel. The sign, rather, is for the house of David, as the text clearly says. The sign is Emmanuel, and Isaiah 8 tells us that the land Ahaz destroyed is Emmanuel's land. Emmanuel would later come and reclaim his people from exile. Thanks for watching.